job is to explain Cuban, Cuba to American citizens. And in that case, I am still an ambassador because I want you to see the complexities of Cuba, not uh, only an only way to look at Cuba. Uh, and I always tell my students, listen guys, you think Dick Cheney and Bill Gates have the same idea about the United States? They say, no, of course not. Then don't think about the United States the way you're thinking about the United States. Try to learn from the Americans. Try to understand the Americans. And then you might be better, better placed to influence Americans to have a different view of Cuba, the view that you want uh, to have about Cuba. And they would just tend to think, like, I've seen one person live, like, amazingly, like, lavish life. That must be the same for everyone. And I feel like if we increase more, like, more Wi-Fi hotspots or more, like, internet access, that maybe that would change the way Cuba, like, day-to-day -day people, like, common people in Cuba change their perception on the United States of America. The technology industry in Cuba is largely underdeveloped due to socialist policies implemented by the Castro government. In a socialist economy, industries that go unfunded by the government suffer tremendously and undergo little to no growth. However, in the past few years, Cuban technology has developed under the leadership of Raul Castro, who is more progressive than his brother and has made efforts to liberalize the Cuban economy. The Cuban population is largely well-educated and are yearning for increased access. Despite these technical, technical difficulties, there seems to be wide usage of these mobile electronic appliances throughout Cuba. For example, at the park in Cienfuegos we saw on the first day, we saw many people FaceTiming and calling on their phones. And at the tobacco farm the other day, we noticed that Onai, our bus driver, and Guillermo, our tour guide, were watching some videos on what we believe was a similar platform to that of YouTube. So since 2006, all kinds of restrictions have been removed in Cuba. Restrictions on small business, restrictions on state companies, restrictions on travel, restrictions on cell phones, restrictions on the use of personal property, and of course, very recently now, restrictions on internet at last. We are far behind you on internet, but we have crossed the Rubicon. Right now, there was a time when to talk about internet in Cuba was almost subversive. It's, it's true that it's working very slowly, but now you have the hotspots all over the city. About 50 hotspots in Cuba, we have it around here. Also where people can connect to Wi-Fi and can freely go to every single web page. The problem is that uh, it is only in those places and it's very expensive. People sitting in the, the sidewalks to connect. Why don't we have internet at home? Come on. The use of internet at home is very limited. University professors, university mm. students, journalists, certain categories of people have internet at home. By the way, dial-up connection. For the private sector, people will use that internet to advertise about their business will use it to learn how to run better their business. You know, when I talk to Cuban officials, I go, you know, it's really a shame because you were the first to have literacy in Latin America. And really in the whole developed world, developed world, right? And now you're the last to have the new literacy. You know? And when you tell me this, you tell me that, you sound like the king saying the serfs shouldn't read. You know, internet's not an option. The head of higher education here said on TV, about six months ago. You can't really call our universities a university system because of the lack of internet. What we would like is that American companies who come to Cuba and invest, they invest, uh, for example, we, we have an example here in Old Havana. In Old Havana, there is a rule. You come to invest in a building in Old Havana. We give you the building, not the building cannot be owned by the foreign company. It can be rented or it can be taken into shape. But that company has to fix the two other buildings inside it. And at the same time, sponsor a school inside Old Havana. So those, those rules that have been increasing in Cuba, they're, they're rules that, that we apply. In Cuba, every day at 8 o'clock in the morning, schools open and the schools are full of kids very well dressed in their uniforms, who attend school. You go to other countries in Latin America and you see a lot of kids in the streets, not well dressed, asking for money, cleaning uh, windshields of cars to make some money. 
not well dressed, dirty. That doesn't, that's that really the case in Cuba. That doesn't mean we don't have problems. Education um, is free and public. Um, so there is no private school like we have in the United States. All public schools do have a uniform system and that's basically nationalized. Every public school has a uniform, which is a stark contrast compared to the United States where only private schools or most private schools have uniforms and public schools generally don't. Our high school system begins in seventh grade, but it's divided in two parts, two three year parts. The first three years, that is seven, eight, and nine, you get, everybody gets the same. But if you do well, you enter into something called pre-universitario. It's a pre-university. It's also high school, but it's pre-universitario. If you don't get good, then you can go, you can either go into the labor force or you can get uh, education in a technical school. The technical schools can be of a different variety. Health workers, accounting, uh, mechanics, uh, you know, but it's, it's technical level. You, you end your technical education in grade 12. The good thing about the system is that if you do good in, the, in this technical system, you can go to the university. Although, technically, to go to the university, you have to go from secundaria basica, that is uh, basic secondary school, to pre-university school. The three years of pre-university school actually to prepare you to enter university. Not everyone who, who, uh, who finishes pre-university gets the right to go to the university. Only the best one. And of course, on, on the basis of choosing, the way that our kids choose is that before, on, on grade 12, they have to undergo uh, exams, the entrance exam for the university, where basically mathematics, uh, history, and Spanish. It was actually pretty interesting to see that people who want to go into the music field had to figure that out by like age seven or eight and even if you're a year or two late it can be very hard for you to catch up which I thought was really interesting because at my school they didn't even introduce music until I was around age 10. But the Cubans really believe in education okay? and so and they really believe in learning so Cubans really dedicate themselves especially as they get older to studying because they really believe that's how they're going to learn and get ahead in the world. And they take it very, very seriously. And the parents take it very, very seriously. People that send their kids in the United States to school isn't going to be taking up a bunch of their income, isn't going to be taking up um, like a large percentage of their income. However, here it's taking up a, like a, a large percentage of their salary that they receive from the government. You, you would be surprised how much things, how much you have in common with kids your age and how much, how many things you can learn from them. We talked as a group about their Wi-Fi usage at first and they said like, first of all, the, one, the first thing that they recognized is they don't have it as much as us and they said that what, where there is Wi-Fi around the city, it's very scarce and they usually don't get access to it every day. So we asked and they sort of pointed out the hot spots that are like 23rd Street and they asked a few people they all pointed out the same spot. Um, they also all mentioned using Facebook or other types of social media and when we asked sort of what do you use the internet for, they basically said like to chat or to communicate with people through Facebook. They didn't mention anything else like reading news articles or sort of learning more about the world around them. Um, but their relationship with the English teacher I thought was really interesting. Like, they were like very friendly. It was more like peer to peer rather than teacher to student. He's from Cote d'Ivoire. Um, he's taught in um, this school for five years and he's been in Cuba for five years. He had great relationships with the students. Like American culture in Cuba became very evident to me when we spoke with the students when something that they were very keen on talking about was sports and music and TV. And it became very evident to me at that moment that due to how sporadic the internet connection is and due to how rare it is to have very the quality consumer electronics that we're all very used to and that most of us have with us right now, that really the American culture that they get, it's not very in their face like it is where we are. That even if you live in the U.S., even if you don't watch a lot of TV, you still probably know who Kim Kardashian is. If you don't watch a lot of movies, you still probably know who people like Will Smith are. And that's not really the case here. That the first really connection I had when like talking with the students was over music, and one of them listened to Ed Sheeran, and then also one of them listened to One Direction, and it was just like something that we both like smiled about, and like, oh yeah, like I know who that is. The cultural influences still kind of do cross. 
it just really made me realize that it's not as separated as I think I thought it was and that like they listen to the same music I do here when I'm like sitting in my room at home and I just thought that was really cool. I was talking to a lot of kids and one of the things that I noticed a lot is that I would tell them like I was in, I was from America and like a lot of them they asked me like oh you from Canada you from the UK I was like oh no I'm from America and they're like America they're like <laughs> the America because they, they don't obviously they don't see these people they don't see American students yeah. and they're like what's it like in America they seem like so interested one of them I asked him he's like oh my god I love hamburgers so much <laughs> he's like he's like don't you guys have those um like cookies with the cream in the middle, and then I'm like, yeah, Oreos. And it's like Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was uh, about didn't really talk a lot about the news or what else was going on. It was very much about connecting with people just around them. I think if you go to the average American school that's not full of LCM kids, you'll find that they don't yeah. use their phone for anything more than Facebook yeah. or communicating with people <laughs> either. I think it's just more of a symptom of being the age they are, and most kids aren't really interested in imperialism or politics. You sort of step out of that, like, our bubble of, like, all these educated kids that we have in, um, in Palo Alto, and we sort of go into the, into the community where they don't really exactly care about, about what's happening in the government or what's happening outside of their own lives and what's affecting their own lives. I just found it interesting to see how many opportunities these people would try to seize to uh, strike a conversation with us because they seemed, re they seemed really eager to share um, their experiences with us. I was like, I'm sorry, I only speak a little Spanish, like, hi. And they immediately were like, oh, you have light colored eyes. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. thanks, <laughs> um, I think. They're like, where are you from? I was like, the United States. They were like, oh, wow, I love the United States. I want to go there. Like, and they just like wanted to know all about me. So I found that it was kind of hard to get questions in um, about like really them and what, like, like kind of more deeper things. I have not been using my Wi-Fi cards to look up current events. Like I've been like texting my friends. I like post it on Instagram. Like so, I don't think it's too far of a leap that they use their limited Wi-Fi access to go on Facebook. You know, they they didn't see us as these people from this government that embargo their entire Ireland and is very adversarial towards the government of Cuba. But they just saw them as, hey, foreigners. People seem to detach all the problems in Cuba from all of these like luminaries that they always talk about, Che Guevara, the Castros, etc. But when I would ask them like the connection between the the presence of the Castros in government and those issues, they wouldn't really seem to make that connection. And it's I think it's just because those figures here are looked up to as almost like these like political gods that can't really be in any way like admonished for anything. I mean I think it's really interesting to see how like maybe in another few years how like the younger generation is going to start influencing all the politics and like if they're going to be vocal about it or if they're going to like go through the necessary channels like Raul's opening up those channels. So just keeping in mind at our very first meeting that we talked about confirmation bias and expectations and again just being very aware of that as you guys continue to go through Cuba. Sometimes as well because we live in the Bay Area, some of you mentioned and we do know so much and we do have many resources but we're also very diverse that sometimes I also feel that with that same token when we travel we often may criticize others that don't also know as much as we do and so it's interesting that in the study of other people sometimes you also have to remember that the other people we study may not have that same ability to study us or that same viewpoint. Some people, you know, genuinely have it, their goal and ambition to send their kids to a good school and just kind of like live in a place that has food and great weather and stuff. So I just think we need to think about that like where our base values are might not be where their base value system resides. Um, and so it's kind of really hard to get yourself out of those stereotypes and that mindset. I know I struggle with that still all the time. Like why aren't they thinking about like what they're, you know, the time they're wasting and, you know, like what their different activities are, but it's just, it's just you totally have to take yourself out of your own biases and put yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that the other side, the Cubans were just as shy and afraid as well um, to come up and meet you guys at first too. So I think sometimes if you just take that first step, um, oftentimes through something that can be like a joke or something about sports or hey, what's your name? Um, just the most basic things can actually get conversation going. In all, it was a really good experience and it was nice to just see new people and meet people our age here instead of adults.